<clears throat> Our text for this morning is Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. I will read those verses for us. Let us pay heed to this inerrant, infallible, holy word of God given to us for our instruction in salvation and righteousness. Colossians 4, beginning in verse 7. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And so, and say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Thus for the reading, let us pray. Once again, our great God and Father, we do thank you and praise you for bringing us here to assemble as part of your body that assembles hour after hour this day that you have set apart to worship you. We thank you and praise you that we are a part of your worship and not a part of the rebellion. Be with us during this time. Guide us by your word and spirit and to your truth, for your glory, and so that we might proclaim your glory to all those around us as you give us opportunity. We thank you and praise you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> we come to the final greeting or greetings of the letter and I think it's profitable for us for a moment just to think about letters in general that we might send or receive this is mostly for the older folks uh, in the room um, because I don't think any of the younger folks even understand what I'm talking about um, all of you younger people when us older folk were in school uh, I believe in elementary school uh, they would teach us how to compose a letter. They would teach us how to address different people uh, differently depending upon their age and their status and their position of authority. And just think about that for a moment, how if that's missing from teaching children, there's a difference in age and maturity and status and authority in our society, how that affects our society. But again, they would teach us how to begin a letter, how to compose this letter, how to put our thoughts together into paragraphs and not just symbols and signs. Um, then how to conclude this organized letter, uh, to conclude it with a summary perhaps, how to close the letter properly. And Paul doesn't follow all the rules that we would follow or teach today if given the opportunity, but there is a structure here. That has a meaning even for us as we contemplate what seems like maybe some disparate comments towards the end. And the meaning is this. We began with a greeting. 
that Paul sent the blessing of grace and peace from God our Father to them. And then Paul addresses this Colossian church with who Christ is, who they are, uh, who they are because of who Christ is and what He has done. And then Paul instructs the church, both individuals and as the church collectively, um, to set their minds on the things that are above. It's not just theoretical who Christ is and what He has done, but now there's practically some things that need to be done. Their practice then, how they are to live is what's encompassed the second part of this letter. And as we, as we have said, if you are raised with Christ, if you are His, if you are in Christ, then these truths that are for the Colossians are for you as well. And now as Paul concludes, we have these practical matters that he addresses. Some of you know that I'm not big on titles for sermons. I don't really like making titles. But this week I like the title. Because as I just said, the title... or I just said practical matters. That is the, the title. It's practical matters. But it takes on a different sense if you put the emphasis on the other syllable um, that the title could also be that the practical matters. The practical things of this world matter. Again, the Word of God is not just some spiritual teaching that sounds great in theory but it just doesn't work practically it works practically we struggle with sin we stumble but as we work together especially mostly primarily as we work together the gospel is proclaimed and the kingdom advances and this morning we get a snapshot of how it works of what it looks like in some sense as god's church works together, some good, some bad, to put into practice the uh, sanctification that God calls us to, the sanctified life that we are to live. We begin with the underlying picture that, that Paul is at work, as we read here, with, with many different people. He's not doing things alone. He's not doing the ministry Alone, The first man mentioned, and I like to say Tychicus, it's probably supposed to be pronounced Tychicus. I will say it differently every time. Um, but the first man mentioned is Tychicus, who Paul calls his fellow servant or fellow slave, as we have said, is probably more appropriate, his fellow slave in the Lord. Onesimus uh, he calls his faithful and beloved brother. Aristarchus he'll call his fellow prisoner. Mark and Justice, his fellow work, workers. Um, Epaphras, a servant of Christ. Luke, the beloved physician. And Demas, as well as others that are mentioned here, peripherally as well as directly. What we read, and I think this is important for us at Sovereign Grace Reformed Church as we uh, continue to make this move into the Reformed Church in the United States. There is a greater work beyond what we are just doing locally. And we should look to the blessing that comes from having a concern for the larger church. Just yesterday, and I'll look in no direction, someone sent me a text saying, I saw that there were some major storms in Sutton, Nebraska on, I believe it was Friday. Right? Our concern is already beyond because we know brothers and sisters in Christ in Sutton, Nebraska. And it can be a burden at times to think beyond the local. It's much easier to just think locally. But it's a burden that we carry in support of the work that Christ is doing to spread the gospel and advance His kingdom beyond just our local interests. Uh, to kick us is someone here that we ought to know more about. Uh, if you don't have notes in your Bible underneath, if you don't have a study Bible, you can write down some of these verses as I go. Because he really is a man that we ought to know more about. He's a man that weaves together some of the storyline of the New Testament of Scripture. <clears throat> in Acts um, 20, verse 4, we see his name along with others. Again, Acts 20, verse 4. Uh, he's there with Timothy, 
He's there with Aristarchus, who we're going to come to in a moment. They're part of this group that worked with Paul on his third missionary journey. It seems that he was one of the men that took the collection to Jerusalem to support the church there in their time of intense persecution by the Jews. Uh, that collection is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 16, Romans 15, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. That was an important ministry to Paul. And if we stop and think for a moment, we could understand it's because it's, it's supporting the unity in the church between Gentile and Jew Christian in that first generation. Antichicus was a servant in that mission. Tychicus was also with Paul towards the end of his Roman imprisonment. He's the one that's going to deliver this letter, the letter to Philemon, the letter to the Ephesians, uh, as we see very similar language in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse 21, compared that to Colossians here, chapter 4, verse 7. We're going to speak to this again, but note here that, that Tychicus is the faithful minister and hopefully you know who Onesimus is. Tychicus is going to stand with Onesimus when he delivers the letter from Paul to Philemon. And Philemon reads that letter that where Paul is compelling Philemon to receive back Onesimus, not as his slave, but as a brother in Christ. Then towards the end of Paul's life, we read in Titus, Chapter 3, verse 12, that Tychicus is one of the possible choices to replace Titus so that Titus can go and spend the winter with Paul. And then in 2 Timothy 4, 12, what we read, and I believe this was, this was option B that they went with, we read that Tychicus had been sent to serve in Ephesus so that Timothy could come to him before his execution. And we also read there where Paul tells Timothy and bring Mark the mark that's mentioned here, bring Mark with you. Again, we'll come to him in a moment. With that brief information about who Tychicus is, you might understand then the significance of this man to Paul and really to the entire early church. A man that we again know or think of very little and then it becomes somewhat easier to hear these words in verse 7 from Paul. He is a beloved brother. And he is a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. We too quickly move past these words about this man. And we should think more and study more to understand. These phrases that are mentioned are similar to Ephesians chapter 6 again, verse 21. And they do three things. Um, besides just identifying, they do three, three things. They identify Tychicus as a beloved brother. He's, he's simply a brother in Christ, a fellow with all of them, a part of the covenant. And they are to welcome him as they would any brother. He's no better, no worse. He's our beloved, my beloved and our beloved brother. But two, he's also a faithful minister. He's proven himself to be a faithful minister uh, for Paul. He can and they can depend on him, on one who is in service to Christ and to his gospel. And he will minister to the people there in Colossae in the place of Paul, who is, again, imprisoned. And so he's the mouthpiece, if you will, of Paul and of Christ. Three, he is a fellow servant. And this is meant to tie him to Paul. He's a fellow servant with Paul, with Paul's ministry. And though Paul is the man that we know, he's the man we discuss, he's the man who theologians write books about that God used mightily, Paul does not hesitate to make Tychicus his equal. He is his equal. He is able to go in Paul's stead and serve as Paul would serve in serving the Lord. And so from the little history you know, we the little history we know, and then verses eight and nine here, we know that when Tychicus spoke, he was received with the same 
authority as if it was Paul speaking himself. And what we can ascertain is that there was much more to be said. And Tychicus was going to be the minister to address what was going on with Paul, with his imprisonment, any questions, concerns. And also he was going to be an encouragement to the church in Colossae. But he wasn't the only one. Onesimus was also with him. Again, Onesimus, a runaway slave that had been converted under Paul's ministry. Whatever Onesimus passed might have been, this is what we know, the feelings that these men had that you might have now for Tychicus, they are the same feelings that you should have for Onesimus. Paul puts him together with him. The exact same description is given in that he is beloved and he is faithful. He doesn't serve in the same capacity. He's not a minister, but he is the same beloved and faithful brother. And note something else. Their trust, Paul's trust, all the men with Paul's trust, I would say Tychicus' trust, in in Onesimus is evidenced in the fact that Paul writes that not just Tychicus, but they, verse 9, they, Tychicus and Onesimus, they will tell you of everything that has taken place. Then we have the greetings given from six more of Paul's co-laborers there. These are with him in Rome. Uh, Again, with our internet and our cell phones, I don't think we appreciate this as much as we would in in the past. We can just send a shoot a text, leave a message and know how someone is doing here. You don't have that. And so somehow we don't know how these men got included in this letter. If they were walking by and they heard Paul speaking and his amanuensis, his scribe, if you will, writing down this letter. And they said, hey, make sure you let them know that I said hello. Uh, That's what we would do today. Um, Or if Paul just felt the need to include them. I, I hope it's a little bit of both. But for the Colossian church and for us, this is again an encouragement um, for the church in Colossae, for Paul himself as they're with him, but that Paul is not alone. That we are not alone. We should not be alone. That God calls us to be in a body of Christ together. He brings us together, even in prison, even at a distance, to be an encouragement for one another. Uh, these six men that come up beginning in verse 10 are div- usually divided up. You, can, you might have it in a note. Uh, though there is no argument for why Paul does this, no proper argument for why Paul does this, but the first three we know are converted Jewish Christians. He says they are the, the only men of the circumcision among his fellow workers that are with him. Um, and then the last three are Gentile. Christians. We might simply for our understanding note that once again, Paul could be expressing, among other things, the unity that is now expressed in the body of Christ and the people of God being Jew and Gentile. Aristarchus is first. I mentioned him him previously from Acts 20. uh, And he was part of that group with Paul on his third missionary journey but he was involved in some other things as well. He is most likely from Thessalonica. That's the city he's associated with. But he is one of the men from Acts chapter 19 that was dragged through the streets of Ephesus during the riot from Paul's preaching. Again, Acts 19. Here he's listed as Paul's fellow prisoner. And and Epaphras is not. In the letter to Philemon, Epaphras is going to be listed as his fellow prisoner. And Aristarchus is not going to be listed that way. So some believe that this is uh, the indication that their imprisonment, their fellow prisonership with Paul was voluntary. And they would enter into prison and stay with him for some time to be an encouragement and to provide and perhaps switch out in that role. 
Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, is next. We read of Barnabas um, earlier being the first one to really work with Paul. Well, Mark is his relative. Um, He's called John Mark in other places. He'd been with Paul and Barnabas on Paul's first missionary journey. But what had Mark done? He had abandoned them. Mark had abandoned Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas attempts to bring him back into the fold in the second uh, missionary journey. Paul refuses. And it causes the split between Barnabas and Paul. They separate. Barnabas takes, Paul, uh, Barnabas takes Mark and they separate and go on a different mission than Paul. We know that they were reconciled from 1 Corinthians 9, 6, from 2 Timothy 4, 11. And here we find that Mark now is where? He's with Paul in Rome. And he sends his greetings to this church in Colossae. We don't know what instructions have been given. Again, verse 10, regarding Mark. But if he comes, they are to welcome him. And if you haven't made the connection as well here, this is the Mark. Um, Mark with Paul, abandoning Paul, refused by Paul, reconciled to Paul, who in a few years uh, from the writing of this letter is going to write the gospel according to Mark. Most likely getting much of his source material from the Apostle Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and having had some conversations now, as we'll come to, with Luke, who will also write his own gospel. Greetings from Mark. Then this other man, Jesus, which we have discussed before in other messages, was a fairly common name. Jesus was a common name at that time, Joshua more properly. But at this point, I assume, and I don't mean to be funny, but it is humorous in one respect. At this point, you probably wouldn't want to be called Jesus. Um, And so he said, hey, how about you just call me Justice so everybody stops being confused when we're talking about Jesus. Um, This is the only place in Scripture that he is mentioned. But he's very likely included again because these are the only, these three are the only three Jewish Christians, as Paul is, a convert from Judaism, that are with him. And having these fellow Jewish men that have converted, have a similar background, uh, it should make sense to us why brothers and sisters in Christ with a similar background can provide just uh, that little bit more of encouragement, if you will, from their background and, and the trials and tribulations that they are undergoing. From here, we move to Gent, to the Gentiles. We begin with Epaphras, whose <clears throat> background we mentioned in the earlier messages uh, on Colossians. Here, Paul states uh, to remind them, as we know, he's one of you. He's one of you. And then we're reminded of the opening of this letter where Paul laid out the thankfulness and the prayers that they are involved in at Rome for the people in Colossae. And, and, and Epaphras is a participant in this spiritual struggle, again, reminding them continually in prayer for the Colossian church. This struggle in prayer is for what we've gone through as well, that they may stand mature for maturity, for the, for the fully assured. They would be fully assured in all the will of God. Pointing back to verse 9 of chapter 1, carried here to the end. Prayer for Colossae and Laodicea and uh, Heropolis, all close to one another in the Lycus Valley. Really, none of them, I believe, more than 10 miles apart. We mentioned this earlier as well. All cities that would have most likely been evangelized at some point, preached to from Epaphras and his co-laborers. All of this pointing back to this focus on Christ and their ministry to present everyone that they can mature in Christ. He then mentions Luke, the author of the Gospel of Luke, the beloved physician with Paul, with Mark in Rome. 
sends his greetings. It wouldn't be a stretch to think that he had been collecting at this point because, again, the gospel is not written. But he'd been collecting, if not thinking about collecting his thoughts on the life of Christ and journaling his travels with Paul. And then Demas, he mentions at the end of verse 14, he sends his greetings. Now, Demas, if you do not remember, um, later in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, this Demas, we are told, in love with this present world, abandons Paul. I don't believe this is the reason he's listed last um, by Paul, but perhaps by the Holy Spirit it is so. Um, but all of this is pointing to our understanding here again that Christ has done an amazing work to bring salvation to his people through the ministry of many to bring salvation to you and to me. That doesn't mean that things aren't going to get messy. Here in these six men, we have faithful servants. We have one that abandons uh, their leaders and then will reconcile and go on to write a gospel. We have a man that was a runaway slave, a criminal, although we might not want to see him that way, but at that time he was a criminal. He could have suffered the punishment of death. But now he is a brother in Christ. And the appeal is made. We appeal to one another as Christians to treat each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. We have Epaphras who does more, uh, does much more than we know. And Tychicus the same. Then we will know this side of eternity. And Luke as well who still has much to do even after the writing here. And we have Demas, who appears to be faithful at this moment, but will leave Paul. Ultimately, as far as we know, he leaves Paul, he leaves the faith, and he never returns. And God is sovereign over all of this. And we should be encouraged, as Paul was encouraged, in prison, surrounded by a few, finding comfort, knowing what God was doing in each of these men at this time to advance the kingdom of God and be an encouragement to the ministry of Paul. But then Paul turns. He's not done to his greeting uh, to others. He wants those in Colossae to send their greetings to Laodicea, again, about 10 miles northwest, to Nympha and the church in her house. We really don't know anything about this church Um, There's a lot of discussion. There's arguments made from manuscripts. Uh, This could be the church in his house. Uh, Again, I think some of these arguments are made because of the way people want to manipulate. Is it Nympha female in her house or Nympha or Nympho or however you want to say that for uh, being in his house? What we can say for sure is that there was a distinct church most likely located either in Colossae or Laodicea, and Paul wanted to make sure they received a particular greeting as well. And what this seems to be pointing to is this idea of what today we call a Presbyterian form of church government, where we can say there was one church in the town of Colossae or Laodicea, but within that one church, there were multiple congregations, there were multiple homes where the people met, Met And there was this particular congregation uh, that met in the house of Nympha. And Paul believed that they needed at this time a particular greeting. And then they were all to share this letter, to share this teaching, to share uh, the word of God. Um, The emphasis is we know today that this letter, uh, we know that this letter is scripture. I believe perhaps they did as well, but it's another argument. Um, It's not just for Colossae. It's not just for one group or one congregation. It has particular application, but by the Holy Spirit, this Word of God will find application for every congregation that reads this letter. But listen, they are to share it once it has been read 
among you. And I think this is important. The meaning here refers to the public reading of Scripture. We might think of the words from the revelation of Jesus Christ where John writes at the beginning, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. The time is not near in the same way here in this letter for the Colossians, but we need to understand that blessed is the one who does hear the words of this letter and who does these words, who keeps what is written in it. All of God's Word. For God's Word is sweeter than honey. It's truth. God's Word is eternal. God's Word is profitable. God's Word is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, judging the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. This Word needed to be read. It needed to be heard. It needed to be digested. And then we're not to just be stingy with God's Word. Then we are to share His Word. We are to pass it on. Here they are to share this Word to the church in Leo. To say, uh, they are to read the letter then that comes from Leo to say, uh. This phrase here causes some consternation about what this letter is. It boils down to this. The majority opinion is that either this is um, a letter from Paul that was sent to Leo to say, uh, and now it's been lost, or it is the letter to the Ephesians that is in circulation, and it's in Laodicea, and it's going to come from Laodicea to them. They are to read it. In either case, what we, need to con- what, we, what we need to remember is that we are to continue to spread the Word of God, the truth to one another, not to receive it, keep it to ourselves, keep it to our own congregation, share what we know with others, as you are to share what you have with me. And that's not just finances. That's what you learn. Share it with me as well. Uh, we have a quick word here for Archippus, which we have no context for. But we can say this. <clears throat> if you were to turn to Philemon, you would find that Archippus is of the house of Philemon. So again, this is all working together. Archippus is listed as a fellow soldier there as well. There's more that can be said, but I'll boil it down to this. Uh, being described as a fellow soldier with this admonishment to fulfill the ministry that he had received in the Lord, it is highly likely that Archippus is the spiritual leader in this house of Philemon. And he needs, Paul is reminding him, remember he's sending a letter with, Tych- with Tychicus to Philemon to do potentially what Archippus should have already been telling Philemon to do. And so Archippus needs to be implementing what is right and true in this church in Philemon's house and that he's been called to by God. And so Paul reminds him. And then Paul picks up the pen, as we would say, and he writes out the final greeting in his own hand. He does this in several letters. This authenticates the letter as from him for those who knew his handwriting. Uh, And with this as well, the other side of the coin is, and we don't think of this as often, it also keeps false letters from being accepted. When Paul puts his uh, writing down at the end, it's like, okay, this another letter doesn't have Paul's handwriting. We're not accepting it as from him. And But in the main, in this last verse, I don't know what to make of this exactly. This last verse, personally, I've contemplated this verse for some time. Again, we know that Paul had what is called uh, an amanuensis. I don't like calling him a scribe that has a different meaning, but it's a person who would write down these letters for him. And, for him. and, and I just ponder when Paul has the opportunity to end uh, this authenticating mark at the end of the letter, he can write whatever he likes. Again, it's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But he can write whatever words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit he can write. And what he writes is, remember my chains. 
It's remember my bonds in the Greek, but it's better understood for us is remember my chains or my shackles. Paul understands that God is sovereign and that he can count, he can count it all joy. That his imprisonment has allowed for the gospel to be spread in places that it would not have gone if God had not chosen for him to be in prison. We believe that Paul is thankful and joyful as he sits in this prison and is able to share the gospel. And he's convinced of this, I believe. But I also believe that he's convinced that we are not. That the Colossian church is not. This sentence that Paul writes, simply remember my chains, is for the Colossians, but it's also for all those that will read this letter, and it's for you. You're still to remember his chains. Uh, What are you willing to go through for the cause of Christ and for the gospel? So often what we think is that we can only serve God if we get everything in order. Once I've got my house in order, when I have all my practical affairs in order, um, then I can be of some use to God. Let me get a little bit more training, a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more knowledge. And so Paul simply says to them, as he's written this entire letter, then in his own handwriting, remember my chains. You can be of use to God in whatever circumstance you find yourself in. We might even say that Paul can be a greater witness to the truth. The truth of the gospel of Christ, the truth to the peace that you can have with Christ because he is under this trial, because he is in the midst of this circumstance and is being greatly used by our Lord. Being used to the point of writing down the very word that you have heard this morning. But do we really believe that for ourselves? This command from Paul, and this is in the imperative, by the way, he's not, he's not just asking, he's telling them, he's commanding them. Um, it might be a command for them to pray. Um, it might be a request for prayer, we would say. But it might be a request for prayer, not for Paul, but for you, for them. We are slaves to Christ. Are we slaves to Christ? Remember Paul's chains in serving Christ in the kingdom of God. And then be blessed. I want to say, remember Paul's chains and be blessed. The words are, the blessing is, grace be with you. It is a blessing. It is a benediction. It is a very short benediction. But Paul begins and ends, again, this letter with blessing, with grace. Our lives from beginning to end are a matter of grace. Grace, again, being the unmerited favor of God. We deserve nothing of what we have. Nothing. And yet, here we are. And by that I mean, here each of us are. Particularly, In this place, so many of us here would have never even known that moral Nebraska existed, much less passed through it, much less made it a point to be here every Lord's Day to worship our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, together. Here we are, called out of the world into the bride of Christ and he called you here into the trials and the difficulties of sinners trying to get along with sinners as we are transformed into the image of our Lord and there will be beloved brothers and there will be faithful ministers and there will be fellow servants in the Lord and there will be those that abandoned us and return there will be those that abandon us and never return 
who will we be? If we have been raised with Christ, we will continue to look to him and not to ourselves. We will seek the things above and by following the precepts, the commands in this letter, um, we will grow together as his people in this place. Or we will find that we love the things of this world more than following Christ and we will never be seen again. If we, if you find yourself loving the things of this world a bit too much, remember Paul's chains. Remember what he did. Remember what others have done. But even more, remember what Christ has done. To receive his grace, his unmerited favor, he took all of your sin and he suffered for it on the cross. This is why Paul could sit in that Roman prison. He knew what Christ had done for him. This is why Aristarchus could be dragged through the streets of Ephesus and get up and keep going. Return to Ephesus. Be with Paul in Rome. Because he knew what Christ had done for him. This is why Philemon needed to take Onesimus back without punishment. Because what Christ had done for both of them. The Bible isn't just theoretical thoughts on good living that somebody may be able to do someday. It's true and it's practical and it's here when we look to find it. There is work to be done, seeking heaven instead of earth. There is suffering to undergo. There's trials and temptations. There's reconciliation that needs to be made. Because of what Christ has done, these things are to happen. Because of what He has done for you. Because of who you are in Him. And we don't do this alone. Understand this morning the work that is done in the local congregation and that is to be done and that should be and will be supported by the larger body of Christ that we are united with. And commit yourself to the local congregation, to the local house, so that we can be like most of the individual people that we've seen here in a church like this as well. Amen. Let us pray.